Thank you uh, for joining us um, for the new normal. Uh, obviously, it's been a really difficult week. Um, and, uh, you know, we were thinking about how we could adapt and, and cover this in a way that's, that was sort of, um, you know, authentic to what, what we focus on. And um, about a year and a half ago, um, I did a podcast, one of my favorite ones. I'm not, I don't say that to every guest, Craig, I swear to God. Wow. Um, uh, with Craig Silverman from BuzzFeed, um, because he covers um, a, a beat that uh, was incredibly important, um, and, and that's around misinformation. And I think we're seeing it. Um, unfortunately, we talk about this as a time of acceleration, and um, I think we're seeing, unfortunately, an acceleration in some bad areas, too. So, Craig, I want to bring you in. You're already here, but whatever. Uh, thank you for rejoining me. I mean, it was almost like a year and a half ago, I think we talked about this. Um, yeah. And at the time, you know, we were just talking about, <clears throat> mostly about Russian bots and stuff like this, and, and it was just very political. Um, and um, are we seeing the, the information apocalypse right now? Uh, I think we're living through the kind of thing that people have been warning about it pre-2016 for the small group of folks who were thinking about this stuff, but certainly post-2016 as everyone, particularly in the United States and some other countries, woke up to threats around misinformation and disinformation. The, the warning was, we're going to get to a point where people don't have a common set of facts to discuss and have reasonable disagreements about. And we might get to a point where people actually can't tell real from fake and they have uh, they have to maybe pull away from the information environment or, you know, they cling to biases. And, and I think if we look from what's happened since March with the pandemic and now through to the protests uh, over the last week or so, we are living through a variation of that. Uh, and I, I mean, I published a piece, I think it was last week, uh, looking at, at this and really arguing that in particular with the pandemic, there is absolutely, you know, motivated conspiracy and medical misinformation communities who are seizing upon this moment and who are doing the best that they possibly can to confuse people, to make it hard for them to decide and distinguish real from fake. So we are in, uh, in a version of the information apocalypse yeah. now, I think, yeah. So I think we discussed this, uh, and maybe you have a different opinion now, so I want to re-ask the same question I asked you a little over 18 months ago which was like, what's the root cause of this? I mean, and I know there's not one, but you know, a lot of people pin this on, on platforms, mostly Facebook, but also Twitter. Um, and they seems to me they probably have a big role in this because um, uh, I know I grew up in, in an era uh, pre-internet um, with urban legends. Um, I remember Alfonso Ribeiro supposedly broke his neck um, uh, um, doing a head spin. Break dancing didn't turn out that Alfonso Ribeiro did that. Those were those were much more gentler, simpler times. Um, but then there's the issue of media literacy. Um, it's it it seems more acute. You're you're coming to us from Toronto, so I, I always like to get outsider. I mean, eh, outsider, but like you know, you're you're not in the U.S. market, um, and so I like to get that. And I think it's a particular problem here. It's one of it's a it's a form of inequality. To be um, yeah, yeah, for sure. And then I think there's a lot of other stuff going on. There's Russians, there's political divisions and stuff. So, so how do you, you know, in this day to day, how do you extract where the root causes of, of this craziness are? Yeah, it's, it is a lot to disentangle. And that's because it is, it is a complex issue. Uh, if you think about like the definition of complex problems or complex issues, this absolutely fits in that realm. And, and I think at the core of it, of, at the core of what we're seeing now, because as you mentioned, I mean, there have always been uh, chain letters and there's always been conspiracy theories. We've always, we've had governments pushing falsehoods, lying to their own population, trying to influence other populations. All of that stuff goes back very far in time. What we're living through now is, is a sort of collision between those natural human tendencies and human behaviors and the way we process information, which has always created these scenarios, and the incentives in the media environment that have created these scenarios. And that's the collision of that with this you know, radically new and different digital environment uh, brought on by certain types of technologies, such as 
you know, social media networking and these kinds of things. So I think it's like we're living through this area of, a, of an unprecedented collision between all of these human behaviors and things we have known about and been dealing with for a long time, but they, they've had gasoline poured on them through social media, through mobile phones, through our, our level of connectivity. And of course, like there's a lot of benefits to this environment that we live in. Way more people can have a voice. Folks who were not part of, uh, able to build their own media uh, institutions and to have their own media can now do that and, and build community and all these wonderful things. But it creates a more open and more decentralized environment that is way easier to manipulate, way easier to exploit. And so all of the governments, all of the financially driven actors, all of the sort of conspiratorial communities, all of the people who just are you know, driven by fear, driven by uncertainty, all of that, it can really be weaponized you know, very cheaply, very easily, very quickly, and you can reach more people. So there's just such a, a, an array of tools and as people call them, attack surfaces now uh, and it's so much easier to deal with that. I mean, like I'm reading a book right now, which is sort of the history of, of so-called active measures, which is like state disinformation, mostly about the Soviet US battle from the 50s and 60s on. And what's incredible is like the amount of resources these organizations, the, these governments needed to have, you know, like Soviet Union had a department of dozens of people uh, dedicated to active measures, dedicated, they, you know, the US government uh, it, when the Berlin was divided, they, they had entire publishing houses cranking out magazines and doing counterfeiting. And today it's like, you don't need a government to go fund a bunch of things. You don't need to buy a bunch of printing presses. Uh, and so it's just so easy for people to do yeah. it. I mean, I, I think back to like, you know, I think, I don't want to call the seminal piece, I'll call it. Uh, you know, when the, the story about the Macedonian teenagers, right? Because you know, I think it was, it, it was, um, you know, that's the power of telling, you know, stories through actual examples, you know, you always bugging reporters about this, like, this is how it, it, it hits, it hits home, right? I mean, because yeah. um, the idea that there could be these, these Mace Macedonian teenagers making tons of money off of, like, you know, tweaking pre-existing prejudices and stuff of, of, older Americans living in Florida and Georgia and Alabama and all over the place is, it's crazy. It is. I mean, and I think it was. Anyway, for those who didn't read the story, just explain right. what exactly and when, and when, I don't remember which, I think it was right after the election or, or before the election. It was, I, it was published exactly a week before the election in 2016. Um, and you know, the backstory on it is that in the summer of 2016, I, I was talking to editors internally thinking about the election. I'm like, well, I think there's a good chance that, you know, Russia is probably going to try and do some trolling and try to influence the election. Uh, and so, you know, the, the goal was to go and find some Russian troll farms and activities. And this was in the summer of 2016. And so I teamed up with a researcher named Lawrence Alexander and we sort of, we went looking for what Russia was going to do, and obviously completely missed it because we didn't report on the Internet Research Agency. So I got a good story, but I missed the one that that was was there. And but in the course of the research, we found this cluster of Trump websites with you know clear kind of pro-Trump or USA politics domains, and they were all registered in this one town in what is the country now known as North Macedonia. I don't want to upset any Greek people. You've got to put the North in front of it these days. Um, and so oh, yes. That's uh, true. Although yeah. I don't do it. That's just well, the, You're going to get some mail, my friend. Yeah, you know, I know the Greeks are, are up in arms about Philip and all It that. was a thing. It was a real thing. Um, and so, uh, oh, by the way, this here, there's a six year ah. hiding behind me. Wow, that's pretty. <laughs> we didn't even plan that. That was like. That's a first. That's a first. Huh? That's not a deep fake, right? <laughs> no, this is a real child. <laughs> is, that one of those, is that one of those Zoom backgrounds? <laughs> He's extremely unhappy. <laughs> I don't need in order to make sure I have a good internet connection, there's no screens allowed in the house right now. So I bought the McDonald's, but clearly that wasn't enough. Um, thank you for your guest appearance, Miles. Yeah. And you ate some grapes. Great. Cool, man. <laughs> All right, why don't you go on upstairs? We found a baby grape. Okay. Cool. All right. So this is life, right? These days? Yeah. There we go. Authentic. <laughs> so, uh, so we found all these websites registered to this one town about 50,000 people in North Macedonia. 
and 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 we grabbed more and more sites and we found you know well over 100 sites with domains about us politics or explicitly about trump and and we were looking at it and you know in fairness like the guardian had sort of written about uh english language sites in macedonia before but what what we did was we looked and we said okay so like what are their best performing stories and what are these guys doing on facebook and when we when we did that analysis we found that like three out of the five biggest shared engaged stories from these websites were just completely false like you know uh hillary clinton funded isis uh the pope endorsed trump uh, and so that was, yeah, and so it really was like this perfect little microcosm of how Facebook has enabled people from all over the world to target the lucrative ad market of the United States and what they naturally gravitated to, because these guys didn't care about Trump, they didn't care about politics, what they gravitated to was work, what worked well on Facebook. And so for me, like the case study of it was them showing what was working on Facebook at the time, which was misleading to completely false pro-Trump stuff, anti-Clinton stuff that targeted older Americans, that was written in a really outrageous way. And these guys were really good at marketing on Facebook. And they, they more than anything, highlighted the problem of the incentives of what was going on on Facebook then and what Facebook has been trying to change ever since. Yeah, I want to get to the Facebook um, thing and their, their, their role here. And we had a lot of questions. Um, before on that topic. And I also want to encourage everyone, you know, use the Q&A function. We want this to be interactive. Um, you know, Miles has already uh, made an appearance. He's already, he told us about baby grapes, but more could you I have a feeling, more? I have a feeling it's not the last we're going to no. see of Miles. <laughs> Let's see if the nine-year-old wants to also make it. Yeah, appear. no, I know, I know the type. Um, so, uh, but please do, um, you know, uh, submit questions, um, but let's just take a step back right here and just to, to get into the, because we're talking about misinformation, hoaxes. I mean, you're like, give us the, we have a slide, Pierre. I think Pierre, our producer can can pull up that really breaks this down because we're talking about like a few different things and I wanna know how you classify it. Yeah, this is really important because, um, you know, that the, the North Macedonia article, you can see in the headline, we use the term fake news. And I started using the term fake news in 2014 when I was doing a research project studying how viral rumors spread and also you didn't start this did you i mean unfortunately i'm sort of seen as the person who helped popularize it uh oh, no. if this is like you gave my, this to trump pretty i mean kind kind I'm of hovering on end meeting i well you know <laughs> i understand it's a very <laughs> conflicting uh scenario for me because like I say, I've been using the term for a few years, but I used it to describe these websites that I came across in 2014 that looked like web news websites and news content, but it was all fake. And I just called them fake news websites. Um, and so, you know, we, we were using that term for years. And what happened, of course, is that after the, the story about the Macedonian teens, which got about a million views, um, and then on election day, I wrote another story about how they were using fake accounts and Facebook groups to really seed this stuff and reach people. And then did an analysis shortly after that, comparing the most viral false stories about the election to the most viral real stories, showing a spike in the false ones. And at that point, there were a lot of people who were trying to understand how Trump won. And a lot of people started to grab onto this idea that Trump won because Americans got tricked by teens in North Macedonia spreading fake news. And I think that got to the point, you know what upsets Trump is anyone suggesting he didn't win legitimately, anyone suggesting anyone other than him had a hand in it. And so I think that's when he decided to take hold of this term and say, you're saying, you know, I'm fake news. You're saying my supporters fall for fake news. Well, you're fake news. Yeah. And so that's created this, I think, necessity. His, play, for his playbook is very thin. So, I mean, I think we know. <laughs> so I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. It's like me puppet, you puppet. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean. That's right. I mean, but you know, the incredible, not to be sidetracked on Trump, but like he really understands and, and yeah. explores this media environment extremely well. And, right. and, and but, but this is not a Trump issue because I think, you know, no. I think that's important because like, um, you know, as much as, you know, uh, Trump, you know, fans this and is, 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 I mean, he's maybe a creature of it really, but like, um, this is a public health issue. I, I look at it as a sort of public health, right? I mean, yeah. That's right. And I think we're seeing that right now in some ways. Yes. And I think it's because it's a global pandemic, which is a huge unprecedented event where people's lives are at risk and everyone understands to a certain extent that threat and what that represents. 
And so it's, it is a good wake up call for some people who, as you had said earlier, view this kind of stuff as just like a political messaging thing. And that's where the term fake news has become really useless to a certain extent because you have authoritarian governments passing laws saying this is an anti-fake news law, but it's just criminalizing dissent and the opposition. And so yeah. we have to use better terms. And when we do these kind of real-time updating posts where we're debunking stuff, whether it's about the pandemic or about the protests, we try to give people a simple kind of code here. And you can see on this slide, you know, we will rate stuff that you know, has been clearly rated to be false whether it's through, you know, it's a video that somebody says they shot yesterday and we can see it's been online for five years, whether it's, you know, people with direct knowledge of an event giving us evidence of, you know, contrary to what's been claimed, you know, clearly false stuff. We also talk about misleading stuff, which is, you know, that example in the middle there is a guy who, a TV reporter who was out covering a protest and, uh, and he was filming the protest and somebody in the middle of the protest, it was a peaceful protest, started firing off rounds from a handgun and he thought he heard shots, so he was replaying the video of it, and the shots rang out on his phone, and some of the peaceful protesters walked over and said, oh, are you playing gunshots to make it look like we're, we're you know, in a not peaceful protest? And so that was shared as a TV reporter trying to plant and sabotage a protest by making it seem like there were gunshots, but, you know, there were. And the TV station had to actually upload the footage of what he had shot and explain it because... Mm -hmm this tweet went viral. So that's a misleading, you know, real encounter that was given misleading context and stuff that, you know, claims that go out there where we can't definitively say true or false yet, or that it's been, you know, misrepresented like misleading. We put the unverified tag on to kind of give people this sort of this warning sign saying, listen, you might want to believe this, or you might not want to believe this right now. It's in sitting in that gray zone. We can't say it's true. We can't say it's false. We can't say it's misleading. So, you know, the message there for people is like, hold on, like, just chill and let, let's see what happens, which is, you know, honestly, the best advice. Have I you been on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what we're trying. Does it work? Mm, you know? So explain to me, like, how you approach this and how it's different from, like, what a Snopes does. Well, I mean, I think I've always been inspired by Snopes. So uh, I think there's stuff that, that we have certainly, uh, I've been inspired by them. I mean, when I was doing my, my research and work debunking back in 2014 and before that, uh, you know, I would notice that in a lot of cases, uh, one thing that Snopes has done is actually put in mixture of true and false. They've created different ratings that they didn't always have. So they would write an article and they would say, it's true, it's false. And they've sort of created a little bit more nuance. And I think everyone who's doing fact-checking and debunking work has realized that it's not always a red light, green light situation. And you need to have that nuance because uh, that's just, you know, we have a very confusing environment and not everything fits into a particular category. And I think Snopes uh, has evolved a lot because before it was a lot of urban legends. It was stuff that was submitted mm. to them only. And it was, you know, they would only typically a lot of time they would deal with something that was true or something that was false and they might ignore the gray. And now they're doing like investigative work, not just stuff based on tips. They're, they're dealing a lot more with that gray area. And that's a big help because yeah. it's needed in this environment. Let me ask you this. Is it risky, the gray area? I mean, because, you know, a lot of this stuff gets, gets, gets tossed together. This is, um, for good reason, a very like fraught and emotional time and like yeah. you know a lot of times people don't want to hear the sort of long-term sort of things well let's think about this a little bit but like mm -hmm. it might be good to do that like um because a lot of times people use this for <clears throat> things that they don't agree with too um and i was reminded like you know uh the the new york times uh published an opinion piece by uh, an elected U.S. senator. Um, and, and really? It, Hadn't heard about that. And it said, send in the troops. Um, and um, I mean, this is a totally different era and that all uh, the, the Times newsroom sort of rose up against it. And um, how would you label something like what Tom Cotton wrote? Right. Well, Just poor taste, bad opinion? Well, I mean, this is, this is the, this is actually, it, it raises one of the criticisms that people have had of fact checkers for a long time, which is that, you know, they try to boil things down to some kind of a checkable claim when not everything can be boiled down to a checkable claim. And you could say that somebody had two false facts in their argument, but the overall argument, you know, uh, will still get traction. And in the case of the Tom Cotton thing, I think one of the, aside from the fact that 
you know, staffers at the New York Times, particularly people of color, has said, you know, this kind of rhetoric is putting black lives in danger because of who is going to get targeted if there is military intervention, uh, you know, which is one of the very real objections. The other one is, I think, a really procedural one and a more fact-checking one, which is he had claims in there that really weren't supported. And the idea that something as high stakes as a U.S. senator calling for military on the streets in the United States would not go through a more rigorous process of checking at the New York Times, I mean, that is, aside, along with all the you know, additional sort of feedback and, and pushback, I mean, that's a fundamental failure by the New York Times, which I think they have now acknowledged after initially defending it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, him talking about saying, clearly the unrest is being organized by Antifa. I mean, look, there have been a bunch of indictments uh, and the federal indictments, my understanding is there's been a, a little more than 20 of them, and I don't think any of them to this point have mentioned Antifa. Some of them have mentioned, you know, the Boogaloo movement, which is a more sort of anti-government uh, far-right movement. And so, like, that's just not a substantiated claim at this point. Of course, Antifa is out at the protest, but to label them as the primary, you know, divisive force here is simply not accurate. And the Times had a basic procedural and fact-checking failure for something that was admittedly a very high-stakes piece to put out. Okay, so this is like, it's kind of one step removed, but it's got one step in this world in some ways. Because I just think there's a danger of conflating all of this stuff together. And it's like, it, as you said, it's like a very complex um, thing. I, we have a good question that comes from Elia uh, Ben-Ari, um, which is, um, how, how does someone reach people who believe and promulgate conspiracy theories? Um, they don't see Snopes as a legitimate and trustworthy source. Um, this was something we d discussed on our podcast. Like, you know, the, the sort of uncomfortable truth is, you know, people want to believe this stuff because it backs up um, perhaps in many cases prejudices or political opinions that they, that they hold and that many of us might not agree with. Um, uh, but, you know, it's like, hey, we've found the problem. It's us. Yeah. But how do you reach people? People want to believe this stuff. They do. And, and look, there's a bit of a continuum to it. So when we, when we look at like the psychological underpinnings of all this, uh, information that aligns with what we believe, we are more likely to accept. Information that contradicts uh, in, in things we know or we believe or, or that we you know, feel to be true, we are more likely to reject. And that is a universal human trait. And the continuum is that if it's very casual knowledge that you and your identity and your sense of self are not uh, attached to, it's easier for you to let that go. If it is something that absolutely goes to how you see the world, your, your personal identity, your political identity, that is very difficult to cut through. And so when we talk about, well, how do we reach people? If we're talking about somebody who is so far down the rabbit hole, you know, that they believe there are secret trials that, you know, Barack Obama has, is in a military prison somewhere and military intelligence has taken over his Twitter account and he's going to be executed for treason any day now, which is literally like, that's the QAnon conspiracy Whoa. theory. If, if people, if someone is th at that point, you're talking about a very long and involved process of, of de-radicalizing a person. So that is- I mean, Do we have like a radicalized, I, I just almost feel like we have like, like, I, I mean, I remember, I mean, like, I feel like, you know, Fox News and, and other sources are like, sort of like, you know, we've always been talking about radicalization. We're like, they're like radicalizing like retirement communities and stuff like. I mean, <laughs> there, there is stuff on Fox in those opinion shows at night that is, you know, completely untethered from from day to day reality. And it's also part of it is it's not even necessarily what they're saying at times. It's also what they're completely ignoring and counter programming. Um, right. which is a choice they can make, but it, it ignores, you know, real events happening in the world. Okay. And so but you yeah. stay away from that stuff mostly? We, we deal with conspiracy stuff. I mean, lit so literally today, actually, sorry, it was last night, I published a story, like that conspiracy theory I just laid out that, you know, deep state are getting secret trials are going to be executed for treason, and it's all part of Trump's secret plan. That's part of the QAnon conspiracy theory. And there is a massive community that is really energized online in Facebook groups, on Twitter, elsewhere, uh, who absolutely believe this, who are bought into it, who buy books, who buy merchandise. And we did a story last night about a guy who's got about 130,000 followers on Twitter, who claims exactly the kind of stuff that I had just said about Barack Obama, who wrote a book that ended up on a bunch of Amazon bestseller lists uh, two weeks ago, 
who's had, who's had questions asked in the White House briefing room based on information he put in his book. And we revealed that this guy is like a 64-year-old Italian dude who has a background as a sound engineer, who has no connections to national security, no connections to military, no connections to politics, but has turned himself into an influencer. Yeah, we thought the influencers were bad. They're getting worse. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about deep fakes. Um, we have an example, I believe, Pierre, right? Um, but explain to people, because I mean, I think deep fakes are one where like, I, I feel like they were being warned about like in a certain way. Um, and it was like, no, this is going to like collapse civilization because we won't be able to tell what is real and what is fake. Um, and I don't know, I, I feel like I don't know if it was overblown, but I think it, the way it like sort of has manifested itself has been slightly different. Yes, there? that's right. Uh, and, and, you know, we, so we made uh, BuzzFeed, it wasn't BuzzFeed News, but BuzzFeed made this deep fake where it started out with Obama saying some, some weird stuff about Trump and then reveals that it's actually Jordan Peele. And, you know, deep fake was made where the voice and the words were from Jordan Peele, but it made it look, look pretty convincingly like it was coming from Barack Obama where I think he called uh, Donald Trump a complete and total dipshit in the video. Uh, and so that was done. And in the video, they made sure that- I was gonna make a fact checking joke, but I won't. <laughs> yeah, and so this still shows that in the video, they didn't just make the video of Obama saying that and leave it up there. They did a split screen sh pretty soon into the video saying, hey, look, it's Jordan Peele and this is a deep fake, which was the responsible way to do it. I'm glad that's the way it was done. But yeah, I mean, if you think about when this came out, deepfakes first started emerging, Vice did great early reporting on it in about 2018, people freaked the hell out. They said, yeah. this is what, we won't be able to trust our eyes. It will untether us from reality. There were so many articles, like there was one by Franklin Thor in, uh, in the Atlantic. It's the, sexy, it's the sexy one. It is, because it's easy to imagine like, oh, yeah. somebody could pretend to be me or someone else yeah. or a politician. You pitch say, that story to an editor and an editor is like, whoa, I love that's it. That's right. It's, <laughs> it's, you pitch a think piece about the end of reality and it's like a sign, you know? <laughs> Done. <laughs> so so this, this has been brewing for two years and the reality is that deep fakes have become a problem, but they haven't become a problem in terms of politics and untethering people from reality. They become a problem because they're used to harass women. There are people who will, you can pay to put, you know, your ex-girlfriend's face in a porno and upload that to, an inter uh, to the internet. And so it's being used to harass and to do really, you know, a violent kind of harassment against women. It is not being used, as far as we've seen so far, to kind of undermine broad reality. And so all the attention on that, we still need to be aware of them. We still need to think about detection and analyzing them. But that's not, that's not what is really untethering people from reality. It doesn't have to be a deep thing. Okay, um, Pierre, do we have a video? We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, Isn't even so. if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dick. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward and the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of f***ed up dystopia. Thank you. And stay woke, b****. Uh, okay. Uh, so this came in, this is like a sort of really big question, but um, it, it came in before we started this conversation, um, which was... Um, what are, the, what are the major effects that all this dif disinformation has on the media business overall? I mean, because I think there is a, there's a giant spillover when trust evaporates, there's a giant spillover. There, there's going to be like, you know, um, unintended consequences of 
an ecosystem, like, you know, economies are based on trust and organizations are based on trust. And when trust uh, sort of goes away, you know, really things stop functioning. Yes, uh, trust, trust is a foundational element of building Western style democratic societies. And so are institutions. And right now, and for the last few decades, as I think people have become more aware of the failures of some of the institutions that we've built, and our eyes have been open and we've had, you know, a, we have a more realistic view of our institutions, the trust in these institutions is falling. And it's media, it's uh, business, it's government, all of these things are, and we're moving in Western democracies to lower trust societies, which is what you find in more developing and authoritarian or post-authoritarian societies, where they simply do not trust authorities. They trust more their peer groups, their neighbors, the people they know. And that is supercharged by things like WhatsApp and messaging apps, where you can have that cohesive community and pass things along. And the information in there takes on a, a perception of more credibility than what's coming on state broadcasting and all those things. And but I mean, we've seen in like WhatsApp is like, uh, you know, I mean, they're like, uh, we talk about platform problems. I mean, in, in, in some of these uh, 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 countries, you know, WhatsApp is, is the favored tool of people yeah. organizing all sorts of, you know, riots and pogroms or whatever, like, I mean, in, in countries like uh, Brazil, for example, it is the absolute vector for spreading false and misleading uh, information. There's no question about it. And for people like me, it's extremely hard to track that back and to uh, see who has seen it, how many people have seen it, and where it came from. Extremely, extremely difficult to do. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's popular because it's a lightweight app. It doesn't use a lot of mobile data. So in countries where data is expensive, and phones are not very advanced, uh, WhatsApp will often work. And so they built a good product, but they didn't build any thought or control in for how it could be powerfully used to spread. And it was false misleading information and target fee. It's the same story over I feel and like, over I again. Feel, I feel like this might be a little familiar. Yeah, but it's- So let's, let's use that to move into the platform question because, right. you know, we talked about this in our podcast, but like, you know, the big overall thing is when all these platforms came, came up, I was like an early Twitter user. I was like, oh, I love it. Um, uh, Facebook. But yeah, the, the, all the promises and stuff, all the undeniable good of these, of these platforms came with a tremendous, tremendous cost that I think a lot of, a lot of us are wondering, like, are these platforms doing more harm than good as they exist right now. Right. And that's a, just a tremendous change uh, from the view of, say, five years ago or what have you. And I, I'm yeah. with you. Like when Twitter and all of them came out, I was, I feel naive about how I viewed these. It was like just thinking about opening and democracy. Yeah. And, and I remember yeah, watching Career Square. It was like, I was yeah. like, this is history. I, yeah. We were watching history and it is only happening because of Facebook and Twitter, and this is right. going to lead to the toppling of, we were naive. And let's, let's recognize that the early groups and early people who were warning about how things could go wrong were often people who are already part of marginalized communities, people of color, religious minorities in certain countries, because they also saw how these could be weaponized to harass, to target, to surveil them. And they were saying this very early on, and people like me, people like you, we were not hearing it. We were not seeing it. We were not thinking that because that wasn't our lived experience. And the platforms weren't hearing it either. Uh, you know, before there was this, you know, this genocide in Myanmar, which was really fueled by Facebook. I mean, literally years before all that happened, there were people in Myanmar telling Facebook they had a problem there. And so, yeah, there's been a massive wake up call. And, and I mean, if you're going to give the platforms any kind of credit, they've, they've changed a huge amount in the mm -hmm. last few years. But the thing that's can they be reformed? I mean, we've seen well, the steps that Twitter has taken. Facebook has clearly um, um, has other priorities. It seems to me. Um, I mean, here's the thing: like, I'm I'm sort of of the mind that their intent, and you can let's assume they have good intent. It's sure. almost irrelevant because of how big they are, particularly when it comes to like Facebook and WhatsApp. Yeah, owned by the same company, they are so big. 
um, and they've hired tons of people to work on content moderation and security and integrity, but they probably could quadruple, quintuple, who knows how many people they actually need to have a meaningful handle on actually applying their policies. So for me, it's like they can have all the intent and all the policies they want. The question is, can they actually apply them? Can they do what they say they're going to do? Can they make, can they enforce the rules on their platform? And they're not able to do that now. And I don't know what it will take for them to be able to do it. So we're in this really weird scenario of whatever their intent is, is almost irrelevant unless they're willing to like, you know, put every dollar they have for a while into this stuff. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, to me, it's like too big to fail is too big to fix too. Yeah. And, and there's a question about, you know, look, when you go back to Silicon Valley's um, fetishization of scale, I was just like, I try not to go on Twitter too much, but I keep going back to it. And like, I guess, you know, Barry Schnitt, who I've known in PR for years, you know, wrote like a little cri de corps about um, the shortcomings in, in Facebook. And of course, then he got sniped at by another Facebook person who, who, who labeled the, the horrible personal insult that, that he couldn't scale. I was like, only in Silicon Valley <laughs> could that be taken as a personal insult. If someone told me I can't scale, I'd be like, what are you talking about? Um, but anyway, I think the fetishization of scale is leading to a lot of, um, a lot of issues. So I guess what I'm wondering is like, you know, a lot of times we like to boil things down to a lot of simple things. It's like, just enforce the policy, just label or, or ban Donald Trump. Just do it. Why is that not the answer to this? Uh, well, because, and it actually, it, I think it goes back to the scale piece is like, if you're going to do something to Trump or you're going to do something to this person, then if you're Facebook, you have to think of how that policy applies all around the world and every language you're in and everywhere you go. Otherwise, you can't actually say you have policies. So they're in a trap of, of their own making of thinking about scale and growth as the only thing that mattered for so long now trying to put guardrails around it and then realizing that they are so big, they have so much scale and growth that setting guardrails puts them in positions where they then have to enforce it and they have to enforce it around the world or they have to create hundreds of different systems of enforcement everywhere. I mean, it is, it is a nightmare. And that's why I think Facebook has gotten to the point of realizing, oh, you know what? Maybe some regulation would be good if we actually influenced it. Yeah. And maybe yeah. it'd be great if Your we problem. had outside- Your problem you know, this outside board and we could kick the really hard stuff to them. So I think like, I think it's very telling that Facebook has come to that point and it's not just because of government pressure, it's because they realize they need a release valve because this is really hard shit for them to deal with, you know? And they don't want this problem. They just yeah. want to make great ad tools, you know? <laughs> it's a good point. Uh, I, I always go back to, you know, early Facebook, um, Zuckerberg always referred to Facebook as a utility until like his um, investor uh, people were like, no, Mark, you know, utilities are regulated. Start calling it a platform. Yeah. Um, uh, and now they're in, a, as one of our questions said, you know, Zuckerberg is in a pickle. What do you think he will do next versus what do you think he should do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I think he's in a- That's a fun one because you don't have responsibility for the company or, you know- the but the, Well, I mean, that's it. And, and you know what? I actually, I don't have a simple list of prescriptions <laughs> for Facebook. Like I think, I think it's, a, it's a hard position to be in for them as a whole, but it's their- position of their creating and they're all becoming fabulously rich while these yeah. downsides are are you know being experienced by people around the world i think i think zuck actually sees a nobility in him holding the line on trump and these kinds of things i think he views that as the principled stand to you know to not come down and to let stuff stay up as much as possible and i, I think that is rooted in his experience as a person and his philosophy as somebody who's been in silicon valley for a long time um, you know, I don't have an easy solution, which is why when I make the criticism, like I try to yeah. acknowledge that is I think it's a really hard problem, but it's also a problem of their creation. So it's not like me not having a solution is, you know, uh, yeah, is, yeah, no, it's up to him to come up with a solution. They yeah. created this, got, got unbelievably rich and powerful off it. It's like, you know, you, you take, take the upsides, you got to take the downsides and it comes with a lot of, what is it? Spider-Man quote. Um, yeah. And uh, so let's and, let's talk about the, the before we go. Let's let's talk about the the protests. Some people say protests. Some people see looting. 
Um, right. This is, it, it's become, even though this is only like, you know, we're into like, you know, a week plus of this, um, this is, um, this is already becoming a, a gigantic um, example of the misinformation industrial complex, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the pandemic is an example of a kind of global information apocalypse because it is a global event. It's got fear and uncertainty built in and there are conspiratorial communities trying to seize on it. With the protests that are going on, and let's, and there are protests around the world, but let's talk primarily in the US. I mean, again, you know, we're seeing just in, incredible kind of stuff is spinning up very quickly. So as, as a particular example, I've spent the last few days on the brick beat, meaning there's been all these viral videos on social platforms of people claiming, you know, at a protest that, um, you know, a pallet of bricks have magically appeared. And it's a perfect case study because, you know, one, it's people seeing something that you see a lot in streets, which is bricks and construction, but now suddenly they are sinister in this context. And then on top of that, you've got people trying to mend it and bend it to their own narrative. So you've got people, including the White House saying, these bricks are being put out there and staged by Antifa to create violence and chaos and overflow the government and peaceful society. And then you've got other people, protesters, saying this is the government trying to set us up, leading, you know, leaving bricks around to try and entrap us to be violent. And then there's a third fringe community of our friends, you know, the QAnon people and conspiracy folks saying this is literally, this is George Soros and Warren Buffett leaving out bricks to try and overthrow society so they can, you know, grab more money and more control. It's funny, when you started talking about this, I was gonna like interject a little George Soros aside and I was like- I went there, you didn't need to. <laughs> all roads, all roads lead to George Soros. Is there any reason yeah. why George Soros, I mean, like- um... It's been a, it's been a, something that has evolved over many years of turning him into, and it has some roots in anti-Semitism. It has uh, some roots also in sort of right-wing because George Soros legitimately does fund a huge amount of left-leading and left-wing groups. Sure. He is a major funder on the left, just like the Koch brothers have been on the right. And so while you have people on the left who you know, view the Koch brothers as you know, evil, and the Koch brothers, you know, they did try to conceal a lot of their funding through, through sort of shell groups and what have you. And Soros, for people on the right, they see him as kind of the counterweight to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just over time evolved that any kind of unrest any kind of protests, um, you know, these rumors about Soros paying them. And it's actually gotten to the point where his Open Society Foundations, if you go look at their Twitter account, they are actually now replying to people saying, we do not pay protesters. So they've decided now to suddenly be vocal, whereas in years yeah. past, they've been quiet. So um, I think the inevitable question, um, as someone who normally lives in, in New York, um, is, you know, is this simply a right-wing issue or not simply, mostly? an issue of, of right wing. I think the way, when I open up Twitter, it's an issue simply, I don't wanna get into like, oh, but good people on both sides, stuff like this. Is this mostly a, an issue of the right wing? In the United States, there is a larger conspiratorial and you know, sort of misinfo community on, on the right, particularly online. Uh, it's, it's larger in the U.S. It is, it is asymmetrical. Uh, I would encourage people who are more left-leaning to also realize that the anti-vax movement has its roots more on the left. Uh, and, you know, so there absolutely are these equivalents on the left, but they are not as big. And I think one reason for that is, you know, for many decades, conservatives in the United States have criticized and said the media has, is filled with more left-leaning people. It doesn't represent our point of view. They've had some legitimate beefs about that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the newsrooms do tend to lean left. And the response to that over time has been to build up a sort of their own ecosystem of right-wing outlets. And so you have a larger right-wing media ecosystem that lives proudly as partisan media. And when you have people, there's, there's, a, um, there's a phenomenon called group polarization. The more people who agree with each other stay together and talk to each other, the more extreme their views become. So by the virtue of building a very successful and large right-wing media ecosystem, you create a sense of group polarization that it, over time can pull it naturally to the more extreme elements. That doesn't mean every conservative media is extreme, but that creates the, the framework for more extreme, you know, false, misleading, conspiratorial content to live and be part of that ecosystem. So it's like, it's about the, about the conditions. Humans can, can turn and start to believe things 
given the right conditions and circumstances. And over time, it's been a decades long process of building that right wing media ecosystem, which now provides a home for those more extreme elements. Yeah. What's the generational element? I know we have a slide. I mean, BuzzFeed News obviously reaches a lot of, um, you know, younger consumers. And I, I think about, I often think about, you know, how it is having grown up analog and then gone into, you know, the digital. And like, I know, you know, yes, we can't, can't work things as quickly. I know how to use a phone, you know, despite some of my younger colleagues belief, I, I do know how to use a phone. <laughs> Um, I, get, I get criticized for my terrible Photoshop. Yeah, skills. like that's, that's, what, that's what I get. It's fine. Um, but I, I do wonder how much of this is a generational issue because I think, um, you know, look, I, maybe this is my, like, I, I think o older Americans seem to me to be more vulnerable, um, not just to, to coronavirus, but to this virus, like, because uh, of a variety of reasons that, you know, not that... It, not like they're necessarily worse than other people. I just think it's it's more difficult to move from a a and particularly the amount of time for from an information environment that was that was tightly controlled and had downsides to that that sort of control yep. into this information environment where information is 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 everywhere. And I mean information in the rawest form. I wonder how much of this is a generational issue because you will have you know, uh, Gen Z people uh, growing up who uh, are just simply more savvy. So, um, so I'll, let me acknowledge the generational issue and then let me perhaps um, undercut our, which is I think a common assumption that, you know, people are, we're gonna be okay in future generations. So uh, all of the best data we have when it comes to the consumption and sharing of false information, false news stories in the United States studies done over the last few years, the, that they pretty much are starting to align that Americans over 65 are more prone to share and read stuff that ends up being false. And I do think that there is a generational element of exactly as you said, they grew up in a different media environment. And I think all of us struggle in this new chaotic information environment, even if you have grown up with it and grown up with phones and the internet all around you, I think still cognitively humans are trying to evolve and adapt to a certain extent. So there is a generational issue, and it's an alarming thing that all of the media and digital literacy funding and efforts, most of it, I should say, not all, that has been put out there since 2016 has been focused on younger people. It's not that they don't need it, but the urgent case is actually people 65 and over. And, and I do want to say that this isn't about intelligence. I'm not saying older people are dumb or they're bad with technology. You can be a smart person. You can be really good with technology, but still have trouble with a very uh, un, like a realistically chaotic environment, um, so it is not about it is not about intelligence, yeah. and I think um, the hope, as you say, is that well, as time goes on and generations come, you know, we will adapt to the internet and we will, we won't have the same sort of challenges as older folks do right now. And I talked to a great researcher named Kevin Munder about exactly this, and I'm like, you know, don't you think we'll evolve? And he said, well, actually, if you think about it, like, so I'm you know in, in my early 40s. And it's like, I'm not on TikTok because I, I don't like the privacy issue around the app. I like the content, but I don't really understand much about TikTok culture. And if I think of myself in 20 years from now, whatever the new app is then, am I going to know about it? Am I going to be connected to that? Chances are probably not. So I think there is an element where we will not always be fully in tune. And the latest app and the latest thing as, as innovation continues at this crazy pace there's a decent chance that we actually age out of this stuff and that all of us continue to struggle as we get older because we don't have to do it every day for work. We're not using the devices in the same way and all the other reasons you can imagine. I don't know. I, I wanted to end this on a, on a hopeful note, but I do wonder uh, when you were talking because like, I think there needs to be more studies done on the impacts on the brain, right? So, you know, that's why I was my point about growing up analog um, and why I can sort of empathize with those over 65 is because your brain is a little wired a little differently. You see like, you know, you, back when we had offices, you know, the idea of listening to music while, uh, you know, being able to write, I'm like, I don't understand how you can do that. But, you know, brains are wired differently. But then I also think about, you know, when we used to travel and jet lag is, is a reality still. I don't think the human, Correct. the human body for millennia did not like get on planes and like and and go across that many time zones that like so I, I just maybe our brains aren't meant for this stuff I'll leave this to the brain researchers 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's a there are genuine cognitive challenges, and I don't. I've never heard a good estimate of like, well, how long does it take the brain to sort of adapt to this new information environment? Is I don't have enough time. I know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably, probably for me too. We're lost causes. Uh, I mean, you, you know, with with all these, if I'm trying to end on a high note, I would point out one, you know, the awareness of these challenges and these issues around misinformation, disinformation, also our media environment. They're greater now than they've been, and there's a sense of urgency around it, and people care about it, and there's funding and interest in all these things. So that's good. Uh, and the platforms suddenly care about this stuff. That's good. Uh, governments care about this stuff. There's downsides to this attention and all of that, but that's, that's encouraging. That's an encouraging thing. And I would say for this, this audience, which I'm sure a lot of people in advertising and media and in the world that, that we're in, is you know to realize like you have power and you can have impact, and you can think about really being conscious of like where your dollars are going, uh, you know, making sure that you are tracking that and thinking about the places you're supporting. You had asked me earlier about like, well, you know, who wins and who loses from disinformation? I mean, there are people who make money from disinformation, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I think being conscious about your role, even if you feel you have a small one, every single person who works in media, who works in advertising and who is consuming and sharing information you are empowered in this environment. And if you think about that power and you think about what you give attention to and where you spend your money and attention, that's a positive thing. That's something you can have an impact on. And in a networked environment, what you do can have an effect on others. And I think that's a really positive thing. Yeah, I think that's a good note to end on. Um, Craig, thank you so much for this. Um, thank, I don't see Miles, but thank Miles for the cameo. He's got two stuffed animals over there. He's good. Okay. He's, he's, he's fine. He's fine. <laughs> He'll be he'll be he'll be a lot better in this kind of environment and stuff like this. He's not sweating it. Uh, He's pretty good on an iPad already. Yeah. yeah so unlike me. Uh, anyway, thank you so much, Greg. I really appreciate it. Again, you guys are you're doing amazing work, um, and um, so uh, thank you for doing that. Thank you, Miles. You want to come say bye? <laughs> bye? Bye, Miles. <laughs> Everybody. Um, and that is it we'll be back next week we have a new episode uh chad mom is going to be uh joining me he is uh, the head of uh vox media studios we're gonna we're gonna be talking about remote production and the future of live streaming um in this in this uh, crazy environment we've got some different stuffed animals there <laughs> but uh i will see chad has to has to top this you know bringing in his own cameo good luck chad all right thank you all thank you see you miles and friends <laughs>